Welcome adventurers to Loop Hero Academy! In this episode we are going to be looking at how you can obtain the Astral Orbs. As far as I'm aware this is the rarest item in the game and it is essential for building the highest level buildings and getting the highest level upgrades within the camp. Now when I was just doing my playthroughs about 30 hours into this game I had never intentionally tried to obtain this Astral Orb and I did not have a single completed orb. You have to get two to be able to build the alchemist tent. Once you have the alchemist tent, you unlock alchemy here, which will allow you to break down resources that you have and then synthesize any other resource that you want with the raw materials. This means that you effectively do not need to make this farming run um, to get resource, this type of resource after you have built that alchemist tent. Now it is at quite the upcharge here, so there are going to be those who want to continue to just straight up farm this resource for all of their upgrades that they want. I however will probably just synthesize from these base resources that I can obtain much more easily. Let's get into it. So. The first thing to note about the Astral Orb is that it is coming from Time Shards. You have to have 10 Time Shards to be able to get a Astral Orb. The Time Shards drop from enemies that have the magic tag. There are several enemies that have this tag, and there are a few that you are going to be able to get from the very beginning of the game. One of them is the Dark Slime here. Now the Dark Slime, as far as I'm aware, the gaming community does not fully understand how you get it to spawn. It has some kind of connection to the Oblivion card. It drops time shards. I've seen this particularly with bandit camps, um, but it does not appear often enough to be practical to farm to be able to obtain Astral Orbs. Another option that you have for getting it is Prime Matter. Now, Prime Matter is the ghost of a ghost of a ghost. So there is a extremely small chance of ever getting one of these when you're having a battle around a battlefield. You have a small chance of enemies becoming ghosts. Ghosts have a small chance of becoming ghost of ghosts. And ghosts of ghosts have a small chance of becoming Prime Matter. I think this is where I got the time shards that I had before I was intentionally going for them. And again, this chain of small percentage chances to be able to get this enemy type means that he it really is impractical for being able to get a large number of time shards. It is still something to keep in mind, and it is just a hilarious um, chain of enemies to go through to be able to get resources. And all of these are going to drop other good resources, so it's not that building this combo of a bunch of battlefields together is a bad idea, it's just not going to be able to get you astral orbs at any meaningful rate. Now there is another set of enemy types down here that will provide a much more reliable access to time shards. And it is a complex set of enemy interactions and combinations to be able to get to this so that we're going to break it down a piece at a time. The foundation of our farm is going to come from tomes. Tomes here are magical. They have time shards and they come from bookeries. Let us see. Here we go. They come from bookeries. Actually, I can access it in the encyclopedia, so I will use that. They are going to come from these bookeries. The bookery is a card that you unlock by building the library in the camp. What it does is it will replace three of the cards in your hand when you pass by an adjacent space to it with three other cards. It will do this 20 times and then it will become an abandoned bookery. At the point that it is a abandoned bookery is when it will begin to spawn the tomes. And the tomes spawn in the fifth enemy slot very similar to vampires and watchers. And I think this is where the combination begins to make itself apparent. Now, Watchers and Vampires have specific text that makes them mutually exclusive. The game says that Watchers are afraid of vampires because only one enemy can spawn in that enemy spot, and the game is set so that the vampires trumpet. They effectively scare away the Watcher, and the vampire will appear in that slot if both had the chance to spawn in that encounter. Now, the Tome has no such text. It does not say that it is exclusive to vampires or watchers. So what actually happens is the tome combines with these enemy types. So you get a vampire mage and a watcher mage. The vampire or the watcher effectively reads the tome, learns from the tome, and becomes a more powerful, more magical enemy. And both of these enemy types can drop these all-important time shards. Now the tome does say that it has a chance to drop the time shard. This drop rate is really low. And 
when the vampire mage or the watcher mage dies, it will still spawn a tome and their drop rate of the time shard is higher. So this is why we are focusing on this for our farming run because you get a higher drop rate of the time shard here by fighting this more advanced enemy. And then it is still going to spawn a tome afterward to give you two chances of getting this super precious resource. So we are going to hop into an expedition where I'm going to show off how you can set up this kind of farming guide and just so that I am laying everything out here at the very beginning. What we are using is we are using the Vampire Mansion. This is a starter card and combining it with the bookery, which is going to give us tomes. This bookery is coming again from the library building in the camp and we are using Temporal Beacon card. This card is unlocked by reaching loop 12 in any expedition. So if you have not yet done a deep run, to see how many loops you can do, I highly encourage you to go for at least 12 loops to be able to unlock this card. There is no achievement, there is no dialogue, but once you do that on any expedition and you come back to start a new one, you will have this temporal beacon unlocked. Now I am going to do this run with the rogue just because that is one of my favorite classes to run. I'm going to be using the arsenal because I think that makes him a lot more durable. It gives him the amulet um, so that he can do a longer farming piece. And the rest of these cards are effectively fluff and support for what we are using. The core is that trio and the Oblivion card I feel like is just basically essential for any of these runs to help you clear out pieces. I'm going to be using it to wipe out any bandit villages or bandit camps that spawn from doing the villages, the villages and the wheat fields. I really like being able to top up your health. Ruins are giving us more... <coughs> Runes are giving us more of our other resources, so might as well try and maximize this farming run for all the resources that we can get. Cemetery it spawns easy enemies for the rogue to clear, spiders are just good fodder, and then this combination forest, river, desert is amazing for building up high attack speed builds. The desert can also suppress enemy health to make it easier for the rogue to quickly eliminate. So. You can check back down in the timestamps to jump to a point in the expedition that you want to see, or you can just follow with me to the end as we lay out exactly how we are going to set up our run here. I have upgraded the smithy so we get the exact weapons that we need. We're gonna smack down the arsenal. Ah, it doesn't matter too much. I do like that the gold cards all have different connections to the path, and we are going to begin to set things up. Now, one very interesting piece of being able to use bookeries is that they are going to allow us to only use the improved tile types um, for these cards. We don't have to use deserts, we can only use sand. We can try and focus on only using sand dunes. We don't have to use forests, we can focus on only using thickets. So, I'm placing down these groves next to the campfire because I have watchtowers, it'll make it very easy to clear those guys out and then we are going to lay in our vampire mansion here. The spots that you want to look for, for and save for your bookeries are ones with access points on three sides. You want to be able to exhaust the bookeries of their 20 card exchange as quickly as possible to begin getting tomes, and then you need either vampire mansions or the temporal beacons around them to be able to spawn the advanced mage type enemies. got our oblivion here this is nice to see our hand rounding out but do not get too attached to any of these cards in your hand because the bookeries are going to be trading them out and it is more important to get the maximum number of trades in rather than holding on to um, these what feel like precious cards I'm just spawning these down spiders are always good for the rogue because they are going to trump up your trophy count very quickly here is our thicket. Smack the thicket down next to the river that is giving us 4% attack speed because the river is doubling the attack speed bonus. So we are going to be reaching insane levels of attack speed incredibly quickly. We have advanced boots here. We have a good amulet. Right now I'm just kind of painting by the numbers. If it is a higher number, I take it. And I do not care too much in the early stages about the overall build. We have sand dunes. We're gonna wait. Sand dunes are kind of a, how would I put it? They're a secondary um, attribute of what we're gonna fill in. We are definitely going to use it. Their synergy with the river. Well, here, I can show it off. So we've got the river down. We're gonna turn that river into an oasis with the sand dune. We place the sand dune here, and then the river becomes the oasis. We lose 0.5% of our attack speed, and enemies lose 1% of their attack speed. 
meaning it is hurting them a lot more than it is hurting us, and we like the sound of that. Also, lowering all creatures' health is in the end to our advantage because there are a lot more of them and they have a lot more health than we do, so they are penalized, again, more heavily than we are. Also, the rogue, with being able to deal really high damage, taking two weapons, having the enemy's health suppressed to the point that we can just one-hit them exactly like that, makes these encounters much, much easier. I'm doing this run on Chapter 2 because I feel like that is kind of a happy medium of being able to harvest a lot of resources and the enemies not being too difficult. Um, if you do this on level 1, you're only going to be able to keep a few... Hmm, I would really like to fight a full vampire village. Yeah, I will do that. We'll see how hard it is for our little rogue to um, clear his way through this. It can be a very good idea to set up this kind of encounter. It's going to give you so many trophies that it is a really big boost for the rogue. And then later on in the game, getting that Count's Lands, the improved village, is also really good for him. Um, now, it would have actually been smarter if I had set this up around the campfire where I have the crossbowmen to help resist me. As it is, I'm just using them on these other encounters. So the crossbowmen being able to fire into the ghouls means that you can clear that with a lot less trouble. And it's just overall a little bit smarter of an idea. We're still going to try and play as efficiently as we can and we made it through without too much trouble. So we will enjoy that. Alright, we are looking at what we want to take here. We are presented with a number of good skills right now. Um, Picky is excellent for improving the rogue's equipment, which he lives and dies by. Fuss is also incredible, and I think that I'm going to take this because we are building this whole run around adding the enemy extra slot. So we're probably going to be fighting a lot more enemies than you usually would, or at least a lot more swarms of enemies. And we will continue to extend the river here. Again, I'm just ignoring all of these lower type tiles for now. We will use them eventually to help fill things in when it comes around to uh, fighting the boss, if it comes to that. We will see what this farming run ends up producing. We have a level 4 amulet. We love seeing that. A level 3 mace with magic damage and damage to all. Again, excellent. And a kotar with magic damage, defense, and critical damage chance. I love seeing the critical damage chance over just critical damage. Now these level 1 boots are nice, but level 4 boots give you so much more evasion that we are going to switch over to that. And we have a spot for another village. Time to figure out where that is going to go. I think that this village is going to play... Hmm. We have one down here. I think I want another one towards the end. And there's our bandit camp, which we hate. Bandit camps can potentially break your items, and breaking the rogue's items uh, leads to a very sad road. <laughs> so, we deal with them viciously. And we are going to throw another grove down over there. We're still waiting for our first bookery, which is making me very sad. I wanted to get one a lot earlier so that we could have been kind of churning through things. And so you could, you could trim down the deck that you are bringing to make sure that it is more focused and then you get the bookery sooner. Um, usually I already have one by now. I've done this run a few times to be able to make the guide and also get the resources that I have for upgrading my camp to the level of that. As is, we are going to continue to um, soldier on to get what we get. The rogue should be fully capable of going to a higher loop level to be able to get a good farming run in any way. And we've gotten a lot of swarmy enemies early, which is very good for setting up high trophy counts, which is really what the rogue needs to be able to do great runs. Hey, I like getting the orb of expansions. Those are pretty rare types as well. Alright, we are going to keep on building up the oasis. And your stamina is going to ultimately pull back um, the really high attacks, hold back the really high attack speed builds, which is what we are getting close to. Your stamina bar is the gray bar down here, underneath the blue bar that is your attack speed. Once it goes all the way down, you have reduced evasion chance and you have lower attack speed until it refills. 
It is not the biggest penalty in the world, but you do definitely feel it. I also feel like the rogue has lower stamina than the warrior. That may just be bias or some other factor that I'm not accounting for, but it seems like when I was building the warrior, I could get up to higher levels of attack speed. I think it's also that um, evasion draws on stamina and the rogue naturally does more evasion than the warrior. And so when I was playing as the warrior, I was able to pour all of my attack speed into my attack, or all of my stamina into my attacks. And here it is being split between attacks and evasion. We're still doing uh, quite well here. All right, what do we want to take here? The chance to simultaneously attack two targets is quite good. I am not too impressed by Hunter's Mark. Um, I do like this enough that I'm not going to go for second thoughts and just do stuff. We're going to build this up. And we got a cemetery. Where do I want a cemetery? There are the dead people. Bring out the dead. Actually combining some of these with the spots where we have the spider webs could be a good idea. That way they're not, the spiders are not just becoming overwhelming. There are no adjacency bonuses besides the desert and the river for oasis between these. So like thickets being next to thickets doesn't make a difference, which is why I don't care when I uh, intermix the way that I am. Uh, can I go one more? I think I can, yeah. We're gonna bring the river up here and then we're gonna bring it around and it's just kind of border. It's just gonna build a border around our board and we're gonna build along it. Get that maximum bonus on all the tiles we place. And because we're only using the improved tiles again, we're gonna get an enormous bonus. And at this point, I am honestly getting worried that I don't even have the bookery in my deck because we're on loop four and we don't have it. Like, what's going on? I swear, if I didn't put the bookery in the deck or I misclicked, I'm gonna be so mad. Uh, we're gonna put the, so we're gonna have vampires down here on this corner and we're gonna have the temporal beacon so the watchers up in this corner. So if you haven't gotten to see watchers before, it was a long time before I saw them at all. <laughs> You're gonna enjoy what you see, these guys are nasty. Uh, I'm going to keep up with some oasises here. There is definitely an argument to just trying to really max out your attack speed before you start going for oasises. Uh, oasis seas, whatever the plural is of an oasis, but I want to keep the attack speed suppressed a little bit. There's the bookery. Oh, where were ya? Trying to make me a liar building this guide. All right, so now we get to start showcasing the bookery. This is where things are gonna get good. Uh, and the second bookery, beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna build one up here so that we have it around the, um, the watchers for the watcher mages. All right, and now part of this is we're going to have to build encounters around these spaces because the enemies do not appear on their own. They only add to other encounters. So there it was, those cards flipping out. It's not because I overflowed. It is because the bookery made a trade for me. And it got me amazing tickets, which I'm going to definitely use. Use and abuse. Here comes the tickets. More attack speed. Bring it on, the lightning fast rogue. This is going to be a vicious, vicious fight. Um, <clears throat> these village question marks are pretty dangerous, actually, for the rogue. The wooden soldier's um, counter chance can be devastating. Um, yeah, I will build a encounter right here. And then we're gonna look to get another vampire mansion that's gonna cover that space. Because right now, um, we would get a tome there, but we would not get a vampire mage. Honestly, we might leave it so that we get to show off to it. Just the tome is, oh, you get to see it when um, the other end is spawn. Ooh, do I want a field of blades? I do not want a field of blades. Field of blades are even worse than those villages. So we're probably going to oblivion that if we get a chance. Try and keep this run a little smoother. We'll see. Their counterattacks. When you have a really high attack speed build, um, their counterattacks can really be punishing. We're gonna go here, and then we're gonna get more ruins. I kind of want ruins over here. I would love to get a blood grove in this corner because the blood grove helps you hunt down these sports worms and actually kill them rather than watching them just retreat and then punishing you later. All right, we got only one weapon, a level six sword. We definitely want to incorporate this. We're gonna take it in place of the one giving us evasion. 
Now we have the boots. All the boots here are just normal trades. Um, and the ones we have are giving us critical damage chance, which I actually really like. Hmm, do I want to use any of this? This would give me a more of an evasion. Well, no, it wouldn't even give me more of an evasion bonus. Looks like the boots we have will stay, unless we traded them for magic damage. Um, yeah, we will keep what we got. That haul of items was honestly not very good. So here, the Watcher was here in the previous fight. Um, he is similar to the Scorchworms in that he will try to retreat if possible. And he is like a support unit. So Benefactor gives an ally 25 magic armor instead of attacking only once per creature. Flees if there are no targets for its ability. So it will give everybody magic armor and then it will go away. And as Fatalism, it has a 33% chance to receive only one damage from an attack and 33% chance to receive 150% damage. <clears throat> so he's really hard to kill. He has a third of a chance of just taking no, effectively no damage. If you do one damage damage, basically doing no damage to him. Um, or you have a chance of just smashing him. But then once he has attacked his however many times, giving out his shield, he will go away. So there, he just disappears. And as you can see, we have no time shards yet. Keyword yet. Ah, uh, we got our blood grove. This is very good. This is part of why playing with the bookery is so much fun. Because it allows you to basically cherry pick the exact cards that you want to use. And that's just awesome. Alright, we've got our Oblivion. Mm, I'm not going to use it yet. I can clear out one of them without too much hassle. Like, I'm not scared of one wooden soldier, right? Uh, but yeah, we're waiting for a uh, forest. There it is. I'm going to use a forest here. I've said that I'm usually just ignoring forests. But I'm using it now for the Blood Grove. Because I want thickets next to the river because they have a higher um, benefit. We're actually going to lose the Oblivion if we don't use it now, so I'm going to use it now. Pop. He's gone. Now, is there a spot that we want this grove is a good question. Yeah, we'll keep building it around here to get more watchers. Maybe we'll get lucky and actually kill one, who knows. Building the spider webs around the wheat fields is a very great combination because the um, scarecrow here has a chance of attacking his buddies and getting a bunch of spiders around him that he's all damaging. It is just a fun cyclone of death. Alright, we'd like to get a few more cards here so that we can exhaust this bottom bookery and then we can begin to get these homes and really showcase the guy getting off the ground. Keep on bending the river around. I don't know exactly how to explain my reasoning, but I like to build the oases in the corner and keep the thickets on all the other spaces. I don't know. Then I just fill in another desert in the very corner. It's just how I usually like to do it. It probably doesn't make too much difference in any way, but. It seems to be how I've always prioritized them. There we got our three new cards. We don't want to spend any of these so that we can exchange the full three again here. This is becoming a pretty challenging encounter. Now if you want your farming to get a little bit easier, I recommend taking the outpost. We got a bunch of... Yes, yeah, so we wanted to place a vampire mansion over here so that it's... Now every single space around this bookery is going to have a vampire mage. And it's going to make this encounter really difficult, but it also means that we have a good chance of getting our time shards. Which is the whole point. The whole point. I'm going to keep on doing this, keep on hunting down those little watchers. And then, as I said, build sand dunes in the corner. Mm, the ruins. I'll use the ruins. Putting the ruins next to the blood grove again. The blood grove helps me hunt down those elusive enemies. We got some rivers here, usually pretty nice, but uh, we want to make sure that we have all the cards for this final exchange. And we have a new ability. What do we like? Picky, again, very good. Shield of Faith. Upon killing an enemy, hero receives one stained glass charge, which can protect them with 20% chance. Three stained glasses max. I like this. This means that you have the priestess's power, basically. Let's see if it comes off. Um... Yeah, 20% chance to be protected by a stained glass window. 
So the unfortunately the windows only appear as the little status there in the corner. They don't appear as like the full animated stained glass that the priestess gets. I think it would have been a lot more visually appearing appealing if they had allowed the stained glass to like appear in front of you, but I can see at the same time why they didn't because that's pretty complex interaction to add. We're gonna look for another oblivion to be able to take care of that bandit village. Bandit village is uh, no bueno. The rogue does not like them. Um, but I think as I was saying before, if you want to be able to ease up some of the more challenging encounters, add the <coughs> outpost to your deck. The outpost works with the rogue very well. You kind of want to be careful, right? It depends on what class you're bringing. It works best with the rogue because you have to pay the guys to the outpost in rare items and the rogue doesn't get any items, so he doesn't pay them at all and then they are actually antagonistic towards the necromancer, so you really don't want them around the necromancer, they're going to make encounters actually harder for him. And then for the warrior, it's kind of a wash, right, because you pay them out. Paying them out's not too bad, you don't lose too many items overall, so I find that they're still beneficial even if you are the warrior class. Um, but especially here as the rogue, they are all upside, no downside. And you gotta love it when you find stuff like that. We're going to come around over here. Uh, do we want to actually pass right by the path? I think we will. We're gonna have to circle around our forest over here that we built. It got in our way. We got our oblivion, so we're gonna use that while we got it. Again, just trying to keep a keep a good eye on my cards because they keep getting exchanged in the bookeries. So you can't you can't save them. You got to be on top of using them when you got them. All right, we've got armor with magic damage, attack speed, and critical damage versus damage all and defense. I definitely like the sound of these. That's way better. Now we have two level 8 weapons, so those have to go in just to max out our attack damage. We get some damage all counter and quick damage chance, which is all good stats. And this one, higher magic shield and some defense. The defense is really not that impressive, but the higher magic shield is. So we'll take it, and we'll take the only level 8 boots, exchanging our... Yeah, just a straight upgrade. Oh, I love it when that happens. I love it when the piece of equipment that you've already decided is good, just you get the great improvement there. Gotta love having the assist from the camp. We're gonna keep on building over here. Um, is it time for more sand dunes and oasis? I guess it is. I put the sand dunes on either side because once the river becomes the oasis, it no longer doubles the effects of stuff around it. At least that's my understanding. Because the text fully changes, doubles effect of adjacent landscape tiles, and here um, reduces attack speed of everybody. We've got a village. Where do we like having our next village? Putting it over here would not be too bad. Then we can get our other wheat fields going over here. Put it up here. Alright. Now things are getting really crazy. Anything we want to add? Not yet. We got really good placement of that one beacon in the corner here, so... Oftentimes you're going to be putting down multiple beacons to get the coverage that you want along the path, but in our case, the path just aligned. The stars aligned before they fell out of the sky, as it were. And we have one time shard. I wish I'd noticed exactly when it had happened to call it out, but that is our first time shard. It's going to be coming from one of those watchers that we just killed. But as you can see, the drop rate is not good. We've been fighting them for a while, and we have pinned them down all throughout with the Blood Grove, and we only have one right now. Oh, I'm sick. All right, what else do we like? Yeah, we'll build the river here. And so this is a reed. It'll spawn a fishman every three days. We'll get fishmen over here. Okay. Um, actually, hmm. Yeah, we'll take the fishman, I guess. And I'm going to leave everything else. Things are getting pretty hard. I don't want to overtax our character before we get really into the time shard farm. We're just attacking so many other enemy types. But hey, as long as we have a really good amulet, like this amulet is two levels higher than the loop, so it's giving us an enormous shield compared to 
what the enemies are doing. And right now our blend of attack speed is pretty good. We're getting plus 65% from uh, the pickets. What is our evasion at? Our evasion is only at 16. That could be part of it, why we are getting... Um, why we are managing our stamina so well is because our evasion chance is really low. Which is fine by me, like we are managing all of these encounters quite well. Let's see, and we have long since converted that taken over village into a more thickets. More attack speed. Ah, just putting two of them down, we're already up to plus 77%. Okay, so this round is where we are going to get the Vampire Mages. Let's see how they roll. We just have to make it up to the bookery, make the final exchange to be able to break it, and then we will see the tomes and the tomes will combine into Vampire Mages. We get a level up right over here. We're going to take smoke screen as well. Let's get through any encounters that happen to go just crazy off the rails. Um, this is really good when you're dealing with flesh golems. Flush Golem smacks you, and then you turn on the full evasion. Alright, here we go. And we have the Vampire Mage. So, let's check her out. Undead Vampire Mage has a soul. She is a legacy, transforms into a tome after being killed. So, this living tome that is merged with the vampire is actually going to survive after we kill the Vampire Mage. And Bloody Pets, so she has the same summon bats as the normal vampire does in this chapter. She does magic damage, 30% vampirism, 10% um, chance hit won't happen. Is that... and then minus 6% attack speed. Minus 6% attack speed is coming from the oasis, uh, oasis and I don't know what the 10% chance for, uh, the attack won't happen. I think that's just coming from her. Now we've dropped it down to the tome the tome is very similar. It also has this chance it won't happen. Oh, they all have it. Okay. Is that coming from the bats? Repelling squeak? Yes. Okay. So it's because the bats are applying that. Um, the tome has this magic shield. It gives force field magic armor to all of its friends at the start of battle. Um, and again, this also has the chance of dropping these time shards, which we have one more. Alright, I hope that I have not made this corner too um, challenging for our character. We do get our next bookery, which we are going to set up. We're going to set it up in this corner, right here with more vampires. Alright, another vampire mage. She goes down. And the next bookery, finally we're getting our bookery. Oh. Yeah, these battles are kind of scary. Yeah, so the art of this farming run is being able to balance out your loop because you are creating these incredibly challenging encounters with the mages here. And you have to fight a lot of them to be able to get these time shards. That drop rate is not good on any of these enemy types, but you just gotta fight as many as you can to make it. I don't know how many fish people I really want to fight. Like, these battles are gonna be so bad. I'm gonna take the river away. Take the river away! And skirt along till we get to the next set we're gonna be doing upgrades. I'm not gonna try and make this loop any harder than it is right now. Like, look at this, 76. Trophies, so many trophies. But as long as we have a good magic shield, I have faith that we can make it through. Alright, we're gonna want the Oasis here. Keep on reducing, because our attack speed is nearing 100%. It's kinda crazy. We're going to want to start using the Oasis to reduce that. We're really close to spawning the boss here. How do we feel about just fighting the boss like right now? Our everything is two levels higher than our loot. 
And our attack speed is really high, which is good for fighting the priestess. Do we have anything else going for us? Not really. Do we have the right skills? Uh, not the best skills. I don't know, I'd hate for the run just to end if we lose to the Priestess. But at the same time, like, our damage output is so good. And our attack speed is really high, so I think we can get through it anyway. Our, our health is basically maxed, we have four um, potions in the bag, so we're gonna do it. Hello, Priestess. Um, I'm gonna save this for deserts, and we're gonna build Pickett's Town here. And then to make sure that we go over the edge, we're going to start building our forest. More attack speed. Here she comes. There we go. Got the fingers and hope to die. So we can make it through this. Next fight is her. Hello, priestess. Would you please stop? I refuse to arms! Alright, attack fast, little boy. Come on, rogue. We're getting through some attacks. And there our stamina completely depleted, so we have to wait for it to refill. What is our evasion? Our evasion's still only at 16%. Alright, they triggered our um, permanent evasion. Our attack speed is pretty slow, so that skill of being able to just go into all evasion is not super useful. We're keeping pretty good pace. It might not look like it with the health bar race, but because we have the potions, we're actually in the lead right now. As long as our stamina doesn't do anything crazy. We're really old as back. We should be up. We should be fine. Yeah, come on! Alright, now it's getting close at the end, but we made it. Hell here again. Go meet again, zealot. Yes. Alright, we get the resource assortment. And what's this little thing? Hero will be automatically revived with 15% health. Uh, oh, that's cool that it shows up over there. We're gonna stay because we are busy farming. And what looks good on all of these beautiful items, man, having all of those trophies that turn in really makes you powerful. Okay, so first we're gonna look at the amulets. We have two level 10 amulets. We can either get magic damage counter evasion bonus or damage all, defense, and counter. Uh, I mean, this has the bigger shield that kind of is making me gravitate toward it. Yeah, I'm gonna keep that magic shield. It's only a few points higher than the previous one, so. And that's the most important stat on it. All right. Damage all. Critical damage, critical damage chance. I like the crit chance, but it's crit damage. Get these two, and then for our boots, we're looking at magic damage and attack speed. I don't want any other attack speed from my items. Defense evasion bonus. Ah, but I do like the crit damage chance. That might make me go back on saying I don't want the attack speed. All right, our attack speed is just gonna be exhaustingly high. And again, hmm. Yeah, we built up the chance, so we might as well get higher uh, crit damage. Okay, there's our build. We were able to replace all of our items. That was how good our haul was. It was all improved. And, uh, yeah, I'll put down the thicket. Here we go. There is our next enemy type, the Watcher Mage. Now this effect out of time, time flows backwards. I don't fully understand what it means. Cause like watching the day, is it actually going down? Oh it was. Ah, oh, it's so weird. Okay, and then Legacy, he again transforms into a tome. After he's killed, he has magic damage. So he's a very simple enemy type. He just tries to hit you with his magic damage and then he's gonna turn into a tome as he dies. And he has a thing of reversing time. Um, I guess that means he would also reverse the regeneration of, say, the warrior or the necromancer class. I don't know if that's the case because it means that you, you gain health per second. So if time travels backwards, then you lose health per second or not. 
<laughs> I don't know. It, he's gone so quickly that uh, I don't really know that. There's another time shard. And this is... This is exactly what we were going for. Uh, the golems just scare me so much when they're winding up for that last big attack. I just want to be able to... Um, I want to be able to evade it so bad that I get super nervous. Uh, we're going to do a few more loops here. Um, just see if we can get a full orb. I mean, even two if we're doing great, right? We're going to keep on pushing. We're up to seven. It takes ten to be able to get an orb. We've got another bookery here. Um, but no amazing spots to use it. So I could build up here. I don't think I'm going to be too bad. Okay, do I have an Oblivion? We've got another one of these villages. Okay, so we're going to be looking for an Oblivion to be able to wipe that out. We'll see when and if we get one. We just go through so many cards at this point, and I'm pretty content to just keep on continuing with this level of difficulty in terms of how the loop is set up. Now, if you are really trying to min-max things, you probably could be still improving how things run here. Honestly, yes, let's try and continue to improve. Let's never settle for enough. So we got more tickets. Uh, this cemetery goes here. You want to mix in other enemy types with the spiders, otherwise they can become overwhelming, just interrupting your attacks constantly. You want to mix it up. Especially if you're farming on uh, chapter 3, because then they're also going to lower the attack speed of those allies that are other enemy types. So that's something to keep in mind. I wanted to do chapter 2 because I was a lot more confident in going pretty deep to be able to get all of the cards. But you can, of course, do this kind of farming run on the later chapters as well. We're going to take the river up, out, and then down is the goal. And more sand dunes. Reduce everybody's attack speed because our attack speed is getting out of hand. Fighting the vampires here. No time shards. Come on, give me the time shards. Those tiny pieces of time. Not bad, another level up. Um, another good piece to... I don't like any of these. You know what? Here we go. Why not? We're gonna cross our fingers, guys, and we're gonna hope that instead of a shard, we get an entire astral orb. I don't think it's gonna happen, but you know, there's now a chance that it does. Or there's a chance of the way. This is making me really wish that I had that ability that gave you, uh, what's it called? It gave you health per trophy. It'd be great here with how many trophies we have. Speaking of which, I'm probably filling another spider somewhere. Gotta love all the little spiders. Filling up all the spaces. We're able to just handle things so well. I love it. Our vampirism at the base 5% is actually meaningful just because we do so much damage. I love it. Um, did we have a spot? No more spots, but we feel sad. Okay, but we did want to nuke something. I think it was this village. Yeah, we'll send that one to Oblivion, and we'll replace it with a ruin so it can't come back. We are the exterminators. Alright, we got more tickets, and we got more sand. Keep on knocking down the enemy's attack speed as much as we can. More spiders. There are more spiders. I mean, right now it feels like there's nothing we can't handle, so there's no reason not to just keep on pushing. We got some new bookeries in, so... Those are nice to see. They can come up, give us more tones, give us more time shards. The, the best possible outcome where I would definitely stop at is once I get 
Um, two. If we get two astral orbs and we're still humming, like we'll just stop because those two orbs will get you all the way up. Hmm. So this hall. So good. My gosh. Okay. Uh, so weapons first. We're looking at only two level 11 weapons, which means we make those upgrades. Get the easy decisions out first. Now we're looking at the amulets. We have two level 11 amulets. So we can either reduce the magic shield. Oh, I don't want to reduce the magic shield. So we immediately go over here, damage dwell and attack speed. Ah, okay. I don't love the attack speed there, but we're going to take it. Now for the armor, we have a bunch of options. We're going to look for something preferably without attack speed or evasion. Like this. Damage all, crit damage, crit damage chance. So that's probably the leader or this one. Actually, we will take... Ah, ah. Uh, either one of those would have been great. Okay, and then for the boots, we have damage all, evasion bonus, crit chance. Damage chance. I mean, the thing is that the boots always give you the evasion, so... We'll take the highest crit damage chance, I think, here. We'll leave off the attack speed. So it's between these two. Damage all and defense. I'll take the damage all because we fight so many enemy swarms. Ah, we've got another blood grove. We should figure out where we want to put that. Put that in a good spot. A blood grove down here in the south would be nice. And I do have this ruin. We'll build up around that. We'll go over here. Very nice. Ah, uh, fighting the fishmen. Ah, uh, the fishmen. Build attack bar to two thirds after missing a hit. Interesting, so they're actually really good against high evasion builds. I've not fought fishmen very much, so I don't know too much about them. I do know that in the later levels they get stronger per each additional fishman. So it's good, similar to the spiders, to mix them in with other enemies when they're not at their full potential. We love seeing the sand dune here, we can build another oasis. Uh, the path is so full at this point. I love it. Hey, another bookery. Uh, this bookery is probably not going to break, and it's probably not going to lead to anything, but if it does, we'll be ready. Man, that watcher has to be the luckiest watcher ever. Every single hit rolled the one damage. Gonna keep on building the river down. Uh, how far down can it go? Uh, one more. Now we turn again. Hmm. Yeah, I want to keep on reducing everybody's attack speed now. More blood grove. More blood grows means more golems, unfortunately, which are very difficult enemies for us to be able to handle at this point. But we also want to just keep things rolling right now. Alright, we got some tickets. And some sand dunes. At this point... I don't want to use forest to fill things in. I mean, nothing is making me build more, I guess. I could just set my attack speed at 150%. Oh, good. <laughs> Alright, we'll counter it. We'll try and keep around 200% attack speed. Or around one, we'll say, what do we say? 175 is going to be our attack speed goal. So we'll build these up to keep it around 175. <laughs> Okay, I saw... Yeah, we don't want to do that encounter again. We will instead of replace it with just a normal village. Ah, and I gave it the bandit village. Ah... Uh, on the river. Okay. And health is being lowered by 23%, which is a lot. 
Now that health, I think, does that health reduction, I think, um, does not impact the magic health bar that we get at the beginning of the encounter, which is why this amulet is oh so good for the rogue on these farming runs. You can reduce everybody's health, and then you can just give yourself a health bar that is unaffected by the reduction, and that refreshes every single round. So good. And here we are. One more time shard, and we reach two astral orbs. And that is where we call this farming run a total success. Especially given that it shows that we could keep on going for even more if we really wanted to. Hopefully we had two astral orbs by the time we make the campfire. I think we will. But that is how you do it, guys. You build up with the bookeries, and you can combine with either vampires or watchers. You can take your pick, or you can do a mix like I am doing here. The scraps that you get from the black oozes and the prime matter is never going to let you do a run like this. You can do this run with any class. I chose the rogue because when the rogue has the amulet, their ability to... Be just really survivable is super impressive, um, but you could just as easily do this kind of run with the warrior or with the necromancer. Nothing is stopping you from using either of those classes, whatever class you prefer. And then you can slightly tweak your build around from there to see uh, for the for the exact encounters that you like, or you can really just hone it down to the exact cards that. Um, you want to use that you think are essential for the build and then just with that focus be able to um, mm, text the encounter damage all defense evasion bonus damage to all evasion bonus evasion bonus man our evasion build here is going to be crazy but uh we want the damage all and then here maybe the counter chance Counter's pretty good against swarms of enemies, so we'll take that. And then out of these... Yes! Crit! Crit build, I love that. Um, but it has a smaller shield. It does, but it... Oh, it's because it's... No, it is full. Well, it's still a level up. But yeah, any class is going to be able to do this. <clears throat> The warrior, when you're going for this kind of farming build, again, the high attack speed and then pairing it with a vampirism means that he does extremely well. And the necromancer... Um, the necromancer is interesting because he scales so differently from the other classes because he scales off of the skeleton level, the skeleton quality, and the max skeletons. And those stats just behave so differently compared to, like, items leveling up and getting the split between the primary and secondary stats. He's a little weird, and I'm actually not sure how well he scales into the real late game. I think that he would be fine um, to be able to handle these kind of encounters pretty easily. He might actually get skeletons that get um, ping attacks off on the watchers to be able to eliminate them without too much trouble. He's also extremely durable because of the um, momentum that his skeleton army gives him, so yeah, I'm not counting out any of the classes from being able to do this. I just used the rogue because I've used him before, I'm very comfortable playing the rogue, how to build him, and I'm very confident that when you have the armory and you're able to use the amulet, he is extremely survivable as we see here. Let's see how many of these time cards are we actually going to be able to get a third astral orb? I'd love to get a third astral orb. And you can also experiment with other landscape pieces. It probably would have been a good idea on my part to include the treasury. The treasury is a great piece for any kind of farming run because it gives you all those extra resources. As you can see here, we maxed out to the 20 on wood, and we maxed out to 20 on memory, page book of memories, and then orbs of expansion. But everything else still has space here. Um, we're not going to push to the max on any of these, but this is a case for if we'd been doing this on chapter 3, these would still be able to level up farther. Also, on the higher levels, just all of your resources. Ooh, we lost our gym. Okay, this is why we nuked the bandit camps, and I got busy. 
They caught me monologuing. They caught me monologuing, and I was punished for it. Now, we'll kill them. Ah, oh, it's satisfying to make them go away. I was kind of hoping that with all the oblivions I used, that I might get a black ooze on this run just to show, but did not. Goes to show that I really don't understand how they work, <laughs> or that they work inconsistently. But we are right up to the end, so. There we go. Oh, and I got the end of choosing. That's sweet. Okay, so two astral orbs, seven time shards. We're gonna go ahead and back out on loop ten here. We could keep going, um, but the purpose here was mainly proof of concept. And so now, with all of these orbs of expansion, I'm able to rock up over here to say the potion maker's tent and say, "Yeah, I would like to improve this." Yeah, sometimes potions don't help me at all. Medicine turns into the poison, and we could just... Ah, the next level actually doesn't require any. The other piece here, this is like the second most rare item, the Orb of Unity. Components, order made from chaos. But there we go, that is how you can obtain the Astral Orbs and farm yourselves up a bunch of time shards, or really a bunch of anything if you want to substitute the cards, just find the enemy type that you like. The encyclopedia will show you on the enemy types what type of stuff they drop, so if you're really missing something, you can go ahead and do an expedition specifically to max that out, tailor your deck towards it. Um, but the Astral Orbs require the most convoluted set of combinations, having to use the tomes into the other enemy types. I hope this video was helpful for you guys so that you are not like me and have to do a bunch of farming runs to try and build up their astral orb collection to be able to get those final upgrades but you can just slide right along in your gameplay progression get it without putting in as many hours as i have so if this video was helpful to you let me know in the comments if there is something that is stumping you in the game let me know and i can potentially give some advice or maybe make a video about it Hope you guys had a great time watching and that you have a great time moving forward and succeeding in Loop Hero. Thank you guys. Have a good one.